Whether you knew it or not, every single person in this room played a part of breaking a record this year. Because for the first time ever, seven and a half billion people inhabit the Earth. Three and a half billion of those live in towns and cities, or what we call urbanized. But predictions suggest our population is going to increase dramatically. And by 2050, we'll have nine billion people on Earth, seven billion of which will live in towns and cities. What that means for us is our towns and cities will double in size in just over 30 years. When you look at this traffic jam in China, or when you even envisage a busy Monte Carlo Friday night, or rush hour wherever you live, that's really hard to conceptualize, twice as many people. But luckily, the way in which we're engaging with our surroundings, our towns and cities, and each other, has already begun to change due to the socio-technological revolution. And that's already started. Who remembers Finding Nemo? I don't need a show of hands, but I'm sure you remember it. The first one, not the second one. That's just come out. It feels like a relatively new film to me, even now. But did you realize that they found Nemo without the use of Facebook? Because Facebook wasn't even available to us when Finding Nemo came out in the cinema. And yet today, it feels like the fabric of our social society. Ten years ago, we didn't have an app. Now we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of apps. Ten years ago, we didn't even have the iPhone to put those apps on. So we've already come a long way in 10 years to the point at which now our digital world is mobile. It's in our hands. And with a touch of a button, we can do pretty much anything. We can go shopping. We can pay. We navigate our towns and cities. We navigate our lives. We manage our health. We manage our finances. We even manage our love life. One in eight marriages in America last year were as a result of app-based dating or social media. And today, in Paris, at the touch of a button on auto leave, I can hire an electric car and drive it from one place to another. Or if I don't want to drive in Paris, because it's a busy city, and I guarantee it will get busier, <laughs> at the touch of a button on Uber, I can have a car arrive at my feet I don't even have to get cash out of my pocket or my phone out of my pocket to pay. The difference between then and now is today we're an account, a digital data account. And whilst that sounds rudimentary, what it really means is that the activities that we do shape and personalize the services that we require. And that will become a lot more prevalent into the future. And if you couple that, with the fact that computing power doubles every 12 to 18 months, meaning that by the time our towns and cities double, by 2050, we could have computing power a billion times stronger than it is today. All of that stuff will help our super cities become super smart cities. But it's not enough to just invest in a city and call it smart because it needs the right ingredients. It is just like cooking. You can't make a great bouillabaisse without great fish, great garlic, and great tomatoes. You can't expect your city to be smart unless the data that we're feeding it and the way that we're using these digital tools is smart too. And are we using those tools smart now? I'd suggest not. Of the 160 billion emails that we send every day, 97% of them are junk or we delete. Of the 1.3 billion Facebook accounts, 100 million of them are fake. There's no doubt that social media removes those geopolitical borders that have been put there from governments gone by. And today, I can share something with a friend in Moscow, or Australia, or Mexico. But we're not using social media in a smart way. And the proof of that was in the news recently. Did everybody see this? Tay, the Twitter account, it was put there it was governed by artificial intelligence. It was put there to learn from the internet and learn from its interactions with other Twitter account users, human Twitter account users. Within hours, Tay had become racist. Within 24 hours, they removed it. One um, 
One newspaper in the UK said that Tay had become a Hitler-loving sex robot. <laughs> By any human stretch of the imagination, that's quite a, a reputation to get yourself in 24 hours. But these are the tools that are going to define how smart our cities become. These will be the blueprint of smart cities, these digital tools. So what I'd like to do is offer three things that will help us become smarter in the way that we use these tools, help us live a more sustained life in a busier, more crowded world. The first one is agility. It's not enough to just accept change. You have to fully embrace change. Because whether you or I like it or not, change is going to happen. The last 10 years should have told us that. Embrace the fact that we don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. Embrace agility, personally and professionally. Secondly, a digital ethos. If quality in really does equal quality out, well, then if we want our cities to be smart, we need to use these tools in a smart way. We need to feed it smart data. And that requires a different digital ethos to the one that we have right now. Lastly, connection. We live in a, a strange time where an emoji, something this big, can replace a sentence or an expression of feeling. And yet we're faced with a world with less personal space, a busier world. So is it not plausible to suggest that our ability to connect on a human level, on an emotional level, face to face, is every bit as important as any technology will ever be? Smart cities will have a huge impact in our future. And we have a responsibility to make it work. And our responsibility is simple. Our responsibility is make digital relevant. Thank you very much. <laughs>